welcome to this entrepreneur's talk at the business school. My name is Aurora Hotchard, uh, head of entrepreneurship programs at the business school. I would like to welcome uh, Chris Sheldrake, who's uh, a co-founder and CEO of What Three Words, um, and Axel Threffel, our favorite Reuters editor at large, um, who's um, going to interview Chris. Um, so a couple of words about um, our, our speakers. Um, well, our speaker, Chris. So he's a graduate of uh, London's Royal Academy of Music. So he's, he's had a career, studied his career in the music industry. And um, I, I find another, obviously, he, he'll share his journey. His journey very interesting from music to being a tech entrepreneur. Um, started his business with two friends. So we'll go through the details uh, about uh, Chris's journey in a moment. And Axel, uh, who is a um, um, Reuters editor at large, he hosts high profile engagements and thought leadership events for and on behalf of Reuters and Thomson Reuters. Um, so we've had the pleasure to work together for five years and we've had lots of very interesting, inspiring entrepreneurs. So today it's really a, a great pleasure to welcome Chris. Um, just a few things about you know, how we're going to work. So this is a 30 minute interview. Um, I invite you all, if you have any questions, obviously it's a webinar, so you can't um, interrupt. Um, so you will uh, be invited to ask your questions in the Q&A. Um, you have the functionality Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And when the interview is over, I will go through those questions, depending on how many we have, and just select a few, and we'll spend about 15 minutes. Um, this webinar is being recorded, um, so everybody knows. Um, so without further ado now, I would like to invite Axel and uh, Chris to now take the floor, if I may say so. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Aurore. I, I'm thrilled to be back hosting um, this really inspiring uh, series uh, for the business school. It, it, it's been um, many months since I was there, well, since any of us, of course, were there uh, physically in the auditorium, but I, I knew it would only be a matter of time before Aurora got things back on track, albeit uh, virtually, and indeed she's done just that. Um, and, and really, uh, what a year it's been. I was, I was just uh, remarking uh, yesterday to Chris that the last time I saw him uh, was back in January on the, uh, the Reuters uh, TV set in, in Davos. And, and just a few moments before I interviewed him, I, I ran through uh, the latest headlines, which included uh, news um, of uh, a handful of, of, of cases of a new highly infectious uh, virus in the Wuhan region of China. Uh, and I, I, you know, I watched that show back in really sent shivers down my spine given what has transpired. So Chris, good to see you again. Um, you know, we weren't talking about coronavirus uh, when we last met, but no doubt we're going to talk about no. it a little bit today. Um, in fact, before I start, before we get on to the business and, 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 and all of that, um, how, how, just tell us how the pandemic has, has altered your life this year. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like everyone, it's kind of um, beyond comprehension of what we thought at the beginning of the year. Um, and but yeah, I mean, for, from our point of view as a business, of course, everyone's at home. Um, there were obviously those moments when we were sort of seeing each other back in the office. Um, but I think just moving to a fully remote environment and then even just like thinking about how you operate a team um, totally differently um, without things like face to face interactions um has has been pretty changing and i would say actually some of that stuff you realize now in what are we now november where you thought okay well by april then um some of this thing some of this stuff will, will set in and, and some of the fatigue and some of the problems but actually i think it's when you've had closer to you know eight months separated from your colleagues that you'd suddenly notice some of the cracks that the in-person communication um actually does to the business so of course like everyone we're 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 working to counter all of those things but I would say just the short term versus long term isn't something that we'd fully comprehend at the beginning. So, so you think you're, you're saying your business along with many many businesses might well have been damaged as a result of the lack of face-to-face -face communication? I, I would say the biggest impact yeah is for our team um, and that's with each other and 
as a company which is operating internationally, we're so used to flying and being face to face with our business clients. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you just remove that, um, it's very difficult to just do everything on Zoom. I mean, not not because of time difference or anything like that, but just because of culturally people who will sit down and have a really dedicated two hour meeting with you over Zoom. Um, it's it's not the same as doing it in person. So I think we've just had to adapt how we how we deal with business as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm going to come come back to this, but one final question on this. Of course, there are those who who look at SMEs and small businesses and entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial spirit and, and bemoan just how how difficult it is um, for, for that group uh, during this pandemic. On the other hand, there are those who say, and I, I imagine you're, I'm, you're, going to, you're, you're going to be in this camp, you know, as an entrepreneur, a small company, you're more agile, you know, you're more um, flexible, you're more, uh, you're, you're better able to adapt. Uh, and as a result, can bounce back more quickly. What, what, what camp are you in? Um, I, I would say we're sort of um, definitely in, in the second half, but our business is somewhat unique in that we, we, we do so much with consumers and so much with businesses and we have to treat them entirely separately. So on the consumer side, we have all these fluctuations in how many users are actually using our product um, because effectively we're a navigation aid and if you're at home, you're not navigating. So we have to deal with, um, with that but also then the unpredictability of the future, which really hits you for, for your planning side. Um, and on the business side, um, I think we're definitely able to adapt for sure. We're small, we can just do new things that we weren't doing before. Um, I think it's just about really trying to juggle all of that simultaneously. Um, and also I think we just find it on, on one level easier, like, you know, it's very, I just think I'm a big fan of going, right, there's nothing I can do about the situation. So yeah. therefore it doesn't cause me stress um in in that kind of way we just go right what are we going to do about it and mm. and we can basically do things you know, we have a few international offices but not like some of the big corporates who, who really really have to rethink absolutely everything so i think yeah we're, we're in camp two and um, we'll figure it out yeah all right um right let's talk about the business let's talk about the journey the inspirations etc and by the way just before we do uh, to everyone watching um if you want to ask uh, uh chris a question hit the q a tab at the bottom type your question in i will either pepper that in uh during the conversation or we'll um, spend some time doing that um towards the end um it's become tradition in this series chris for me to to, to ask uh my interviewee my guest what the elevate what their elevator pitch is what the what what the cocktail party line is oh for a cocktail party right um what 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 is your elevator pitch um, sure. So sort of lunchtime cup of tea pitch uh, would be. Um, so Wealthru is a global address system and we wanted to make it very easy to talk about anywhere in the world. So we divided the world into three meter squares. You got 57 trillion three meter squares around the world. And we named each one uniquely with three words from the dictionary. So something like table, chair, spoon. There's enough combinations you can do that across the entire world. And what that means is that it's very simple for me to then talk about any particular place. So the front door to my office in London is filled count soap. Um, Really, it's something akin to GPS coordinates, um, but very long uh, numbers are complicated for people to remember and communicate. So by using just three words, you can talk about any particular point on the planet. Right. I mean, I've got so many questions about that. So 57 trillion three meter squares in the world that includes oceans including oceans and you sat down and uh, your kitchen table and, and worked this out did you um yeah so if you were to do that it would take you quite a long time um many like millennia um so y- you're basically making a mathematical algorithm which will go and and take each effectively coordinate at three meter intervals um and just go around and, and name it so on one hand it's sort of not as hard as it sounds on the other hand it is as hard as it sounds i mean what what do, what we're all I think you know who's, whoever's read the brief is, is well aware that you were frustrated with the with the, the, the current systems but you were producing music gigs and and and, and hosting uh, you know, and you had a background in music how did you get to doing this as a business and thinking okay this solves a problem on the one hand but maybe I could also make money from doing this so I mean as much as I was organizing music gigs and, you know, I did my degree in music, so I, I'm a kind of musician at heart. What you actually end up doing when you're out and about in the music business, you spend an awful lot of your life just trying to get from A to B. 
Um, and then if you're if you're the manager or the tour manager, you spend your entire life trying to organize lots of people to get from A to B. Um, and in some ways that ends up dominating far more than music and what you thought you were going to do. So for my life and given where, you know, you show up somewhere new every day. Um, it's really the kind of freelancers world. And I'm sure you, Axel, as a journalist, you're finding the same thing. You're always popping up somewhere new. And just using the address or whatever you're given in every country, whether it's directions, address, or some sort of dodgy directions, um, it just kind of really frustrated me a lot. Um, but I, and, and also, you know, if, you're, if you have to organize a big production and people are not there for four o'clock and you've got to start the show at six o'clock, it's an absolutely massive problem. Mm. Um, it's it's not like just not finding your friends in the park uh, with a minor inconvenience. This is something which actually affects your business. So I tried to enforce on the London Music Business GPS coordinates, thinking, well, this will be very straightforward. Everyone's just going to type in an eight-digit latitude, an eight-digit longitude, <laughs> and my bass player will find the exact door. What could go wrong? Um, <laughs> and and then you just actually find in the real world people like dude what on earth do i do with this degree sign where's the space is there a comma why um and it just kind of dawned on me that this i don't think this system had been made for people to talk to people it's made for machines to talk to machines so it was really just a chat with my um friend who's a mathematician and i was like how can we sort of change coordinates into something totally idiot proof um so that any the musicians I work with are going to uh, not fail to get to the right place. And, um, and, and it was he who actually came up with the idea and said, like, I think we could use sequences of words. I, I, I guess, kind of denied it. <laughs> right. Right. I, I guess, I guess what, what I find fascinating though, as I said, you know, you, you were solving a problem here. So it helped get you know, um, roadies to gigs and <laughs> band members to gigs. But how did you ever think we're going to go pitch this to to private equity companies or pitch this to 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 um, investors, and we can really make money from it. What do you remember when that when that switch happened? When that link happened? Um, yeah, I mean, I think when when I first came up with the idea, because I'd sort of been batting things around, and when when we had this idea of the three words, it was actually fairly instant for me, which was I think this solution is so elegant that. I think it can be a global standard. And look, I'm a, I'm a big glass half full optimist generally. Um, but even, even given that, I still just thought this is so utterly simple. I can't believe nobody's done it. And the cog started turning in my head of, yes, it could be international and, and yes, we could build a company. I certainly didn't have any idea of what the details of that would be and how on earth we would do it. But I think there was a sort of straight away, I'm going to drop pretty much everything in my life and just crack on and do this. Stra yep. Strangely, Mohan, my friend who was a mathematician, I don't think was sort of quite as taken by it on day one and sort of thought, well, you know, we could do this as an interesting project on a Sunday afternoon at some point. But I was kind of guns blazing. Yes, we we should do this. But, but when you but then then, of course, it comes to having to when you think, yes, we're going to try and build a business here to raising money when you go sit in front of investors you need to have a really really good plan um uh, a business plan you need to think about the future and about strategy um what did you take to them um it's a fair question uh, in, in the early days um i've got, got to admit it, it was a very vague loose plan and that i think is because also what three words is unique in that you're trying to build a standard you're trying to get people to use, I don't know, something like the metric system in a world where people only use feet and inches. It's very, very unconventional. I mean, my last business is very straightforward. I, I called people who wanted to book bands and offered them bands and they wanted to buy them. Um, with what three words, it's, it's a difficult pitch for the consumer because people are like, well, I'll use it when everyone's using it. And if you pitch a business, they'll say, well, I'll put it in my car or app once you've got all the consumers using it. Yeah. It's pretty much impossible to get going. So we were actually very open with investors in the early days and said, look, we think we've got a great idea. We don't really know how we're going to do it. Um, but obviously, over the last few years, we've, we've figured that out. But were um, you, were, sorry to interrupt, but were you actually winning money saying that to potential investors? Look, we think it's a great idea. We don't know exactly how it's going to work. I mean, were, were there investors who really were taking a punt on a company and, and a plan that hadn't been developed? Yes, um, that, that is how it went. For, for the first two years, let's say 2013, 2014, when we were doing our you know, seed round, that is really what we were saying. Mm. Um, it wasn't until we, we took our institutional money in our Series A that we had a properly formulated plan as to how to do it. But I think that's something that if you've got a strong concept, you, you can do that. 
and people will believe in you to figure it out. So do you, do you think, yeah, I'm interested in this because do, do you think that would work? I, you know, you've got a strong concept, but you don't know exactly how it's going to work. Do you think it's, you could sell that as successfully to investors uh, in a, in a down market, you know, right after, uh, you know, in 2008, 2009, in this context now, for example? Um, I think so. Yes. Although I do think that just so much more, if I look at then, which is 2013 and now, um, there is so much more just literature and plans and ways of thinking about things, which are just so like thrust into the public, like, you know, apps are now totally second nature. I mean, on one hand, you could say they were in 2013, but still it was relatively early days for apps back then. Um, and also, I think in down markets, investors are looking at alternative inv investments. And so, and, and a lot of people say, look, you know, you're investing in a startup now. It's only in three years time or something that they might have to actually be taking on the economy in that way, by which time everything will be fine. So I, I think I think startup investment is famously good in, in down markets. Um, any, any, any juicy, funny anecdotes from pitches that you can share with us or any, uh, you know... <laughs> lessons that you learned you know things that you really should do and, and things that you really shouldn't do um i think the slightly odd thing about what three words and raising money is that we we basically weren't trying to ever or we never sort of did a dedicated fundraise because the the idea is so kind of quirky and interesting and also very marmite kind of just polarizes opinion people either are obsessed with it and think it's interesting or or just very indifferent and think why on earth would you do that with three words and it's a bit weird um, and so what would happen is, given that 50% of people think it's great, we would just be telling people what we we're up to and people were going, can I invest? And these are people, you know, some cases I've, I've known for many years, I didn't even know they did investment. Um, but somehow it just kind of hooked the imagination uh, and people would come in. So I think probably just the irregularity of that. And I would talk to other startup founders who are I'm going... I'm losing you a little bit, Chris. I don't know if your connection is... Oh, OK. Aurora, can you hear me OK? Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can yeah, hear you again. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think you you went in. Okay. Okay. No, I was just, just just saying like um, I think that just the irregularness for us was about the fact that we never really had to do those pitches and it was all just done so ad hoc. Mm -hmm. And I guess back to your earlier question about having a plan. Um, I mean, look, we we obviously were trying things um, relentlessly all of the time, but there just never became this pressing need to have this formal plan until until we raised institutional money. Um, but we just tried yeah. so much um, to get there. Okay, let's get to how how well the company is doing now. I know you can't um, talk numbers and and real specifics, but how well are you doing? To give us an idea of how you how you're growing um, from a from a revenue uh, potential revenue standpoint. Who your clients are, you know, where the opportunity is. You know, when we spoke in Davos, you you were there speaking to some of the big automakers. I don't know, and maybe you can tell us if you walked away from Davos this year with uh, with some deals up your sleeve. Yeah, so I mean, the best way to measure what three words of success is actually do have people heard of it and are people using it. Um, and over the last, let's say, 18 months or so, the UK um, has really taken off in a way that I feel like if I can if I can talk to people and give them a three word address, there's a pretty good chance that that person will know what it is um, and how to use it. And really, that's the key. Um, and also, when you're growing a standard, back to my point about the metric system, um, whilst it's really, really hard to get going, you get the converse benefit, which is once you're over that critical mass bit, um, loads and loads and loads of people start using it. And so um, in, in the last while in the UK, we're now up to, I think, 84% of emergency services who will accept a what through us address, you know, when we were on like number one and two huh. of those. Um, you know, again, you're, it's this kind of odd sounding system until you say, well, look, so many of the different services are accepting it um, and it becomes standardized for that particular use case. Um, we're then doing a lot in cars. So for example, Mercedes-Benz was the first car company uh, to put it into their navigation mm -hmm. system you can just speak the three words say hey navigate me to filled count soap and and it will take you to that three meter square off the back of that and as you say you know we go to places like davos to meet other car makers motorcycle makers we now got triumph motorbikes we put in their navigation system tata motors in india so the same sort of things is happening there that people kind of catch on to it in a specific industry and then think well actually if this is going to be a navigation standard i should get it in my car yeah. 
pronto. Yeah. Um, so from our point of view, it, it's going really well. The tricky bit is we really want it to be a global standard and it kind of needs to be a global standard. So how on earth do you take on 200 countries at once? Um, but for our, from our point of view, the key is to master the UK, which is our home market, and then copy and paste that strategy elsewhere. Hmm. Okay. Um, so automakers, uh, emergency services, logistics, humanitarian groups, how, how do you actually, how do you though make money? I mean, you, you just, is it as simple as you charging them to use this service in their car? Um, I see what you mean. So the World Through Words app is totally free. Anyone can use it. Um, and people yeah, now expect right. almost a free app. Um, so what we, how we charge is exactly how addresses are charged today, which people don't often know. So if you get into um, yeah, you, you hail a ride for a taxi and you put in your address at number one Regent Street that you want to go to. People don't know that um, the taxi app has to pay to turn one Regent Street into the GPS coordinates, which is called nice. geocoding. So there's a business called geocoding. And um, so we charge exactly the same. If, if you want to put us in a service, you pay to convert the three words into the latitude and longitude, which those businesses are used to doing already. Uh, can you hear me still? I'm still. I'm, you're dipping in and out, actually, Chris. But I, I think you had finished in, finished your sentence. Um, look, we've got um, some questions coming through, and I'm going to pop, pop these in because this is where we are actually in the conversation. You, you mentioned Mercedes, and a question comes through whether um, um, the partnership model can improve revenues and enables quick growth uh, within tier one clients. Comes that goes to the question: Does it ever become a problem with conflicting companies? I.e., you partner with Mercedes, and it prevents a partnership with BMW. Or are you talking about these? companies as clients rather than partners so i mean they're, they're definitely both but i think when you're growing a standard something fundamental about that is it has to be able to be built into any different company system so you know exclusive deals is not something that we do because you can't have a metric system that's only available for certain people who use meters um so it actually is totally fine that we can work across these businesses um and, and generally, everyone's on the same page. They want to make navigation in cars better. Um, voice navigation is a massive pain point. So everyone's pretty aligned. Uh, a question is, who was your first partner and client and how did you get them on board? Um, first big partner client was the Mongolian Postal Service, um, which wasn't the most um, logical um, you know, place to go um, if you're looking for early, early clients in the UK-based startup. But... Um, at the sister event to Davos in China, I actually met a guy from Mongolia um, who said, look, we, we have a huge country here, not many addresses, you should come um, and check it out. He then called me back and said, look, I've just bought a third of the Mongolian postal service and there's a huge problem. People are buying stuff online and they can't make delivery. So, so I went, um, we then localized the whole system into three Mongolian words, which is also no small feat um, and, and then got it up and running. And, and, and it's used there. We now have an, an office of, um, of 10 people in Mongolia. Um, but it's, it's a great case of product market fit being if you've got the right thing for the right people on the right day, um, then you get up and running and, and we yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. Right place, right time as well, I guess. Um, it, th there are a few questions coming through on, on the pitching process and I'll come back to those at the end, I promise you. But I, I just want to move back to um, the the current context the difficulty of the current context or the potential difficulty of course travel uh, the travel industry and the auto industry are, are, are two big industries you work pretty extensively with they've both been hit pretty hard in this pandemic does did that worry you at all when when all this started certainly worried us um in that i think at the beginning of the pandemic the biggest problem is the uncertainty which is you know am i going to be able to pick this conversation up in a month a year, a week, um, and then not quite knowing what to do. I think now that we've worked out that the auto industry have kind of got over their hurdle, which is, you know, are we going to shut down the plants and that kind of thing? They're now relatively back to business as usual. Um, so, so that's now much more settled for us. What we have seen, though, is e-commerce. Uh, and of course, for us, the, the value is, you know, finding people's houses, which in still a lot of countries and in rural areas, even in the UK, people still can't, you know, couriers can't find houses. That's gone over you know, a thousand percent for us um, through the mm -hmm. pandemic. Of course, e-commerce is, is thriving everywhere now. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, so, some some very good fortune for us business wise, um, as well as, you know, the auto industry being kind of rocked. And you mentioned emergency services. I mean, again, during the pandemic, I imagine... 
Well, th th this is this is how you are contributing in many ways. Um, you know, we talk about the NHS in, in, in this country and we, we, we used to and perhaps we will again applaud NHS workers and ambulance drivers every Thursday, Thursday evening. Um, this is you mentioned, I mean, clearly this is something that's growing uh, here. Is it easy to make money in, on that, in that sector as well? So the emergency services is, something, is a sector we don't charge at all. Yeah. Um, and, um, and we're very happy to be able to offer the, all of our services totally for free um, for, for that sector. Um, and it's, it, you know, in, in some places it's chronically underfunded um, and it's, it's a matter of life and death in terms of where the location is for that emergency. And so given it's, it's a very simple thing for us to offer that service, um, all of them, police, fire, ambulance, air ambulance, coast guard, all of them benefit, um, and and that's great to see. Um, in fact, on that point, I mean, I've heard you talk, and I think I've spoken to you about social entrepreneurship. You know, doing business and doing good at the same uh, time. Um, it's something we hear more and more about. Uh, investors want to hear more and more about it. How how important is that to you, and how to what extent does that drive a lot of what you do? It's absolutely enormous for us. I mean. If what three words is going to really, really work, it has to be truly global, as I mentioned earlier. But then you've got to remember, like, about four billion people, according to the U latest UN stat, don't have an address for where they live. Um, and there's you know, huge parts of Africa where street addresses don't really exist outside of a few streets in the capital cities. Um, enormous parts of Asia. Um, and all sorts of things you just take for granted. Like if you go and get a bank account and you're asked to put your address on, and if you can't, you can't get a bank account. Mm -hmm. So all these kind of things that, that are, are enabled by what three words um, are really important and powerful um, and actually apply to a huge proportion of the world. So yeah. on one hand, if you're trying to get a drone delivery in some sort of future tech scenario, that's great. But a lot of the, the volume of what three words usage can come from people who just need a really straightforward way of explaining where they yeah. are and, that, and their key assets. It's interesting because you're fortunate, I guess, in a way, because, you know, when we talk about purpose and doing good, I mean, this is almost a naturally integrated part of your business, isn't it? It is. And um, and I think with that in mind, everything we do is incredibly long term focused. All of our investors are very long term focused there. Everyone's working to an outcome where what three words is a global standard. And for us, we work on a lot of these kind of projects um, in developing world countries um, without infrastructure there around addresses. Um, and it's just been a part of how we we do what we do um, from, from day one. But it's not something that we kind of overthink. Um, we we need to make progress in the UK. We need to make progress abroad. Case studies in one country will stimulate someone to get in touch for another. So we just maintain a healthy balance, and and it, it works well that that everyone benefits from what we're doing. Yeah. Um. You. I mean, when I read descriptions of your company, mo most people call you a tech company. Um. I imagine that's right. But I also I wonder, and, and again, this is something you and I spoke about in Davos this year. You know, whether being labelled a tech company is 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 uh, you know, g given the issues around privacy, trust, use of data, um, and, and monetising that data, uh, w whether that's something you 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 want to be um, uh, uh, associated with right now. So I, I mean, you're right. The tech company label goes far and wide. I think one thing that we're conscious of and basically the fundamentals of our system a lot of people think well is is you know communication now machine to machine in every way is data just going from everywhere to everywhere about everything and address is one place that really doesn't happen um you know for one thing people often with our three words they'll write it down on a piece of paper mm. um or they'll they'll sms it or, or whatsapp to somebody and this is not done through our platform and we're not capturing data we're trying not to capture data um and and we have no ambitions to be a data business um, just by becoming a global standard for communicating location um, is a big enough job and we have no aspirations to um, to do anything around data and, and it wasn't really as a byproduct of anything and any of the negative parts of, of what's happening um, you know around big tech as you put it but um, I think there is still huge benefit in just online to offline pieces of, of tech um, which are totally self-sufficient. I mean, one of the things, what the world works totally offline, let's say in a car, we'll never even get that data, which is actually a problem. You don't know how many people are using you in the car. Um, mm. But but it's much, much better for us to, to think, look, the world is still 
um, not perfect in terms of how everything communicates. Just make sure our product is set up for the world in which we live because we're not 50 years down the line yet. Looks like we lost Axel. Um, so I'll I just jump. No, you're back. Chris. You, are you there? Uh, yeah, I think we lost you. <laughs> Chris, we lost you for a while there. Can you hear us? I, I can hear everybody. Yeah, I we was fine you. with I think we you you you, uh, you you were gone, Axel. <laughs> oh, oh, I was gone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> Please don't go. Going. Please don't go. Come back. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Oh, well, I'm back. Um, uh, hopefully, I'm sta this is a stable connection now. If you, if you lost, you just, uh, what, three words, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look, I've got a, Chris, I've got a few, um, uh, I've got a few other bits and pieces I want to ask you, but there's some questions coming in as well. So let me come to those. And I'm jumping around a little bit. Um, back to the pitching. Um, in early days, did you go through pitches via referrals or did you approach them directly, i.e. cold calling? Did you do a bunch of cold calling at the beginning? And how tough was that? Um, so most of it was referrals. As I said, it, it was just kind of slightly organic how it worked. Um, I'm a big fan of a cold email um, and just being opportunistic because by the time you've thought whether to do it or not, you might as well have just done it. Yeah. Um, so some of our stuff has come through cold, but a lot of referrals in the early days. Okay. And another question comes through. You presented at TED and the WEF. Did you find these and other big institutions and, and pitch to them or was your product loud enough by the time you were doing that to be heard by them? Um, in the case of TED, we actually pitched and said, I think I'd done a couple of TEDx talks and we said, look, you're doing a, a TED Africa event. We're doing a lot in Africa and they were really taken with it. And so that's how that one worked. Um, WEF came to us um, and yeah, it, it's always a bit of a blend. Yeah. OK. Um, has any country or area prevented you from applying what three words uh, for, for the app to be used? No, I, I think... Um, Every country shares issues with location communication. It's just one of the things where we're using two centuries, three centuries old tech in every country throughout the world. Nobody feels like they've solved it. Um, so, so what three words is, is available globally. And how many countries are you working with now? I mean, how many countries are using it? So, I mean, every month there, there's, there's definitely uh, 190 plus countries where we have users. I'd say there's probably seven or eight countries um, where we're seeing most of that, which is um, yeah, the UK, Germany, Canada, US, Middle East, Japan, Korea, um, and now starting to be Australia as well. They're probably the ones we're most focused on at the moment, um, but, but plenty of others coming up. Um, you, I heard you say um, that you're an unashamedly responsive company. You need to be nimble, flexible. You need a partnership with other uh, innovative organizations. Um, yeah, yes, you're partnering with some of the big auto manufacturers, some of the some of the big big corporates out there. But what about partnering with other small, innovative, entrepreneurial minds? Um, on the one hand, and then two, if the Googles or the Amazons or someone approached you, what would you say to them? So, on on the first point, I I think the it for us, and I would, I guess I would give the same advice to other startups is like. You, if you're going for a big company, you're both giving each other what you need, which is, you know, for us, the big company stamp of credibility um, is really the most effective way for us to move forward at the moment. Partnering with other startups, I mean, we definitely do it, but it, it's not as impactful as, as a big company. But similarly for them, they want innovation and that's what we're providing them. So I am a big believer in thinking actually sometimes it's easier to close a deal with the bigger company than the smaller one because actually our, our product fit is, is there. Um, to your second question on, on those big companies, I mean, look, we're, we're working plenty with Amazon uh, through Alexa, and um, Alexa is, is a great example, actually, of another standard, which, which they're trying to build into the standard for voice communication. Um, and there's a bunch of work we're doing there. Um, and so, yes, all, all the big tech players we're you know, in talks with in some shape, form or other. What, what's wh where's all this going, Chris? What's your amb ambition uh, with the company itself, but also you running it or maybe stepping away from it in the future? What uh, where where are you going in your head? So the ambition is definitely to be a or the global standard for communicating location. So just there was a sort of a moment where I know a journalist on TV would it would say sort of Twitter colon and then at and their handle, and then there was a day when they removed the bit Twitter because just at and the handle was enough and everyone knew what it was. That's basically an analogy for where we want 
what three words to go. If you see that three word address and you see the three slashes, wherever you are in the world in whatever language you see it, you should know what to do with it and that it's a what three words address. That for us is success. Um, and in terms of the corporate side, I mean, definitely I, I want to um, stay with the business as long as humanly possible. Um, I love it. It's kind of like the formulation of everything in my life um, manifests itself into to this job. So, um, yeah, we, you know, we're, we're going to see it through. You, I mean, you just defined success uh, for, for us. Where, how quickly can you get there, do you think? I, I think now this is two to three years away. Um, it's definitely a feeling of critical mass here in the UK. You know, when... <laughs> I know you're sort of your mum's friends, cousins, tennis partner sort of is is talking about it. And you kind of hear it on the uh, on the grapevine. You sort of know that you're you're getting to that point. Yeah. Um, and and I think scaling up shouldn't be that hard now that, you know, the product's in great shape. Your API is in great shape. Um, you've made loads of mistakes on you know, all of them. Um, but I think hopefully going into other countries will be a lot quicker. When can you when can, when, when will you start turning a profit? Um, I would say similar kind of times into the future. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different plans that we're looking at at the moment, but really growth is what we're prioritized um, on at the moment. And so to be honest, we, you know, the profit will, will come when the profit comes, but, but we, will, we will go big on growth in the meantime. And, and actually quite a specific question about um, operations. Um, becoming a global standard means utilizing teams in, uh, in uh, worldwide. How are you able to control cash burn while trying to put the product in various markets at the same time? You know, I, I guess, you know, put simply, you're, you're trying to build this, this business, build this company, build the aware, awareness. How do you, how do you keep the, 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 the spending down while you're doing that? Uh, absolutely, because it's, it's the classic trade-off. I think um, how, how we break that kind of chicken and egg and how we don't have to go so hard is that we rely on the partnerships we do and their brand to push what through us out. So every time we, we partner with somebody, there's kind of a mandatory process that we try and put them through, which is to tell everyone about it through social, email, paid, any of the channels available to them. Because if you're just doing consumer marketing, as, as, you, as you know, it's incredibly expensive to do it, consumer by consumer in every country. So the key is for us, leverage that brand that you've done the deal with um, and use their users as your starting point. It looks like we lost Axel. Let's just wait a few seconds. I'm sure he'll be back. Um, Aurora, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yeah. you, well, Axel. Yeah, okay. Um, has there ever been, I mean, you come across as a, a really optimistic, um, as you say, glass, you thought, oh, just not worth it now. It's just too much like. It looks like we lost Axel. I'll just jump in and just um, ask Costas' question out loud. Why musicians make great entrepreneurs until Axel is back? Hi, can you see me now? Yeah, I, I was just jumping on a question. Axel, I, I got it, yeah. I so got the it. one I, about the musicians. <laughs> let me, but let me, but yeah, we'll co I'll come to that in a second. But let okay. me quickly ask a question. I'll ask. I, I don't know why I keep dipping in and out here. I, I apologize for that. Um, has that you? You're an optimistic guy, um, Chris. But has there ever been a time where you thought it's just not worth it? I, I, I this is just too tough. It's a. This is a. It, 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 I, I really don't. I want to get out of this. I haven't. I mean, obviously, you get like horrendous days where you just feel like everything's gone wrong um, that could possibly have been thought of. Um, but I think there's just like an innate inside of me belief that this concept is the one which will get the world thinking differently about addresses. I mean, not not every standard which should be made actually succeeds, right? We're still using QWERTY keyboards, which were invented, I think, specifically because they were the hardest ones to type on. Um, and, and no other standard has ever prevailed um, for, for whatever reason. But I do believe that what three words is that concept which deserves to win. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's always, always in the back of my mind that we'll make it. All right. And, and to that question that Aurora just posed, why, why do music, musicians make such gr great entrepreneurs? I, I mean, I'm guessing it's the creativity and, and uh, the sort of perhaps maybe a little bit more of a laissez-faire attitude. I don't know. What, do you, what is it, Chris? Uh, potentially a blend. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what kind of sample size the question asker is, is referring to. <laughs> um, but I think one of the good things in my life about 
working in the music business was that we we traveled the world we met loads of different people and saw loads of different stuff and probably for me that's what the driver was just having gone out there and seen that this was a problem in the world even though the industry i was in seems totally disconnected um so maybe it's that yeah and and what, what I, i've read some interesting weird uh times and places and ways that what three words w- was used what's what, what's the the quirkiest that you've come across i mean i i you know just to clarify what i mean you know i saw some walker up in the the highlands you know had to um show his location to emergency services but there have been some pretty quirky quirky uh uses usages right yeah i think sometimes it's just kind of yeah the things you never think of i mean we sort of have a, a channel on our slack for all of the use cases that come in and, um, you know, you, you'll feel like, you know, the sort of badger association are using you for sort of spotting badges or something. And <laughs> it's not that there's anything weird or wrong with badges. It's just, again, like the Mongolian Postal Service, it wasn't the first thing that we had on the business plan. And I think it's just sometimes those kind of uses that just make you smile and go, that's great. You know, we're not having to push or stimulate mm-hmm. this use case. Mm-hmm. It's, it's off its own back. It's actually, you know, it's just got me thinking about one final question, and maybe this is a little bit left field, but um, what, and I, and I, I raised this because I was speaking to our CEO, Thompson Reuters, about this the other day. Day, you know, a company with purpose, um, you know, tr- trying to do good at the same time as, as, as making money. What if bad actors were, were putting what three words to use to their ends? Um, is there anything you would feel you needed to do about that, that, that from an ethical, moral perspective? Or, or is that just part and parcel of, of coming up with a product like this? Um, so we, we have, as part of our terms, conditions and, and guidelines, um, some fairly clear explanations of what you cannot do with what three words. I mean, on, on the one hand, yes, you're trying to make a global standard, but, but it is important to take an ethical stance um, on how your technology is being used. So we, we set this out on our terms and conditions. It's something we spent a lot of time thinking about, because, of course, as you say, the, the two, there is a balance there. If you want to say, look, here's a standard for the world to use as, as you will. Um, but I say for, it, it's worth a look um, on our terms um, for anyone who's, who's interested to see how we've handled that. Yeah. OK. Re- really, really interesting, Chris. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed speaking to you again and learning a little bit more about um, uh, about what about you and about what three words. Very quickly, what what's next for you? I mean, as we as we hopefully move towards a, a vaccine for this pandemic, you know, whether one takes the vaccine or not, uh, hopefully we're going to sort of come out of this 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 fog at some point next year. What? How does that? Ch- I started by asking you how that the pandemic has ch- ch- altered what, your life. How does that change your life again as we get back to normal? Do you think? I think there will be a surge of activity for us and any, anybody who's involved in international meetings and business and travel, like everyone will be at those events. And I think that once that vaccine comes and is deployed, it'll be, it'll be, um, it'll be huge. I mean, in, in the meantime, there are plenty of other sectors which have been fast forwarded. So not just e-commerce and logistics, but things like drone delivery. People are now going, well, look, do we, can we use it for medical um, reasons, which is actually getting some of the legislation approved when it would have taken longer. And so what through us and drone delivery has long been a, a kind of marriage that we're, we're pursuing because of course where on earth is the drone going to drop the the package um so something we we released last week uh which gq magazine said was like how james bond would order an uber you can now speak three words so you say filled count soap uh index home raft to your smartwatch it'll order you an uber between the two places we called it three word go and that was just a side project during the pandemic so um Brilliant. yeah pl- plenty of plenty of fun stuff coming up Excellent. All right, Chris, look, it's been a real pleasure, as I said. Uh, you know, stay, stay safe. Uh, look forward to chatting with you next time, hopefully at some point again in Davos. But uh, Chris Sheldrick, thanks very much indeed. I'll hand it back to Aurora. Thanks, Thank Axel. you. Thank you very much, Chris, for your time and sharing your, your thoughts and your journey. It's very insightful. Thank you. Axel, again, thank you very much for running this interview. Um, the good news is I've got um, someone just confirmed that they're happy to come and be interviewed by Axel. I'm not sure I'm well, I'll just say it's Anne Boden, um, founder and CEO of Starling Bank. So I'm yet to just confirm the date and I will share it as soon as I have it. Um, but until then, I think uh, we've got lots of uh, food for thought. Thank you so much, Chris. I think thinking musician, tech entrepreneur, just makes you think anything's possible with a lot of hard work and resilience and passion that's uh, that's very visible, visible, I would say. Um, So thank you again. Um, 
I guess we'll just leave it here and say see you next time. Thank you both again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, Chris.